Writing Out Loud. A program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. Our super special guest today is award-winning young adult author Matt De La Pena. Thank you for being here, Matt. It's an honor to be on your show. When you think back over your early years, you've often described yourself as a reluctant reader. I wonder if you might elaborate on that for us. Yeah, well, I just didn't grow up as somebody who was reading a lot of literature. I just didn't think books were a club that I belonged to. Why? You know, I think I viewed myself as an athlete. Mm -hmm. I didn't view myself as a student. And I think this happens to a lot of young men, young boys. Mm -hmm. Um, my mom really did make books a big thing when we were really little. She'd read us a lot of picture books. But I think over the years I had some educational setbacks where I started to define myself as not a great student. And I guess I didn't feel at home in books. Can you remember the first book you read that made a difference to you? Yeah, I think uh, The House on Mango Street was, mm -hmm. was a really big experience for me because I felt like it was the first time I read a book that felt like my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like when you are a reluctant reader, you need an entry point. And so if you feel at home in the neighborhood or the setting of the book, it's you're gonna be more likely to engage in the, in the, the story. I heard you say earlier today that another book that influenced you was The Color Purple. Yes. The Color Purple was a real incredible experience for me because I think growing up, I didn't see what books could do for me. Uh, I didn't mm -hmm. see the benefit of, of reading novels. And when I was exposed to The Color Purple, I was in college, and I remember having this huge emotional reaction to it. And I realized that that was something that was missing in my life. I, I grew up in a machismo family where you, if mm -hmm. you're a guy, you have to be tough, you have to be hard. And here was a book that made me feel all these emotions, and I realized that I needed that. So books became my secret place to feel in a weird way, The Color Purple was, was my gateway drug because I started <laughs> looking for that feeling in other literature, other, other books. You went to college on a basketball scholarship. What were your life expectations at that point? I, I think I didn't see beyond my freshman year of college. I basically, all my eggs were in the basket of getting into college, being the first in my family to, to go to college. And once I got there, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what to expect. There was nobody I could ask mm -hmm. ab about, you know, what is college. So when I was young, it was all about getting into college. And then when I got there, I just, I felt like my life began, mm -hmm. my, especially my interior life. Mm -hmm. I started taking school really seriously at that, at that point. And you eventually found your way into an MFA program. When did you realize you were a writer? There were two distinct moments. The first one was when I was in high school and I had an English teacher that really kind of basically told me I was a great writer, even though I wasn't ready to hear that. So at that point, I still wasn't ready to hear it, but it was in the back of my head. Oh, she thinks I'm good at writing. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing is I was writing all these kind of spoken word style poems, mm -hmm. you know, secretly hidden in journals, never showed anybody. And then I, I, I went to my English department and I saw that there was this flyer um, and it was this writing contest and they had little strips hanging off, you know, you're supposed mm -hmm, to take one. Mm -hmm. I tore off the whole sheet. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, commitment. Yeah, and I said, you know what, I'm going to, if nobody else knows about this contest, maybe I'll win it, you know. But it turned out that I ended up winning the contest and it was the first time I ever, I guess, put myself out there with my writing. And when I won the contest, I thought, man, well, maybe I could do this. So it was kind of like that uh, epiphany moment. Maybe I could be a writer. Why the focus on young adult fiction? Young adult fiction found me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when I wrote my first book, I just thought I was writing a book. Um, I wrote the book, finished it, got an agent. He said, Matt, he called me uh, about six months after I finished the book and said, hey, Matt, there are two uh, imprints that that are interested in the book. One of them is Grey Wolf, which mm -hmm. is adult literary, mm -hmm. and one of them is Delacorte, which would be young adult. He said the young adult imprint is offering a second contract for a, an unpublished book, um, and the, it's a better financial package. I'm leaning toward the YA, what do you think? I was like, yeah, that sounds great. I was so excited, jumping up and down, and then I went home and Googled what young adult was. I'd never heard mm -hmm. of it. So mm -hmm. 
what happened is I had to, you know, tame down a few of the sexual mm -hmm. moments in the book, take out a little bit of the language, although they still let me keep a lot in. Mm -hmm. And I, what I realized is that I love the coming of age story. I love to read it. Mm -hmm. I love to write it. And it just so happens that my career began while the young adult boom was happening mm -hmm. that we, a lot of us didn't know about. What are some of the common misconceptions about YA literature? I think a lot of you know, I had one, one uh, female writer recently say to me, oh, you're writing young adults, so you're in it for the money. And it you're was, kidding. yeah, and I was like, you're viewing young adult as divergent, you know, all, all the, the big books that are, you know, made into movies, but there's some incredible literature being written in young adult fiction today. So I think the biggest misconception is that it's pop, it's uh, simple, shallow, just super fast, but there is some great literature. Being, people are taking big risks in YA, but it's not the stuff that you see made into movies. Who are some of the young adult writers you've looked to as mentors? Mentors, um, well I guess you could say Sonar Cisneros in the way that she, she's written a couple younger mm -hmm. books. She's not technically a young adult author. Gary Soto, Mexican-American mm -hmm. writer, he was doing this way before I even knew what it was. Um, Pam Munoz Ryan, but some of the new, the new, fa uh, I guess Walter Dean Myers was mm -hmm. a, was a, he was, he's the godfather of what I do, Essie Hinton. Yeah. You know, these are the, the legends that are writing the stuff that I'm doing. They paved the way. Yeah. Some of the newer authors, like Jackie Woodson, A.S. King, Marcus Zusak, who wrote The Book Thief, you know, there, there's some incredible writers that are choosing this field. Well, it's amazing, and you've, you've had an incredible career already, and you're just a young guy. Let's talk about your first novel, sure. Ball Don't Lie. How did you get the idea for this book? You know, I think they always say your first book is, is really close to home, and it was for me. Uh, I just wanted to write about a kid with nothing except for the game of basketball, and that's where his home is. Um, so I, I sort of took my love of basketball and how I, th I feel like in a way I owe basketball everything. It got me to college. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to almost write an homage to the game of basketball. So there's a lot of authentic street ball uh, action in the book. But at the core, it's about a kid who's in the foster care mm -hmm. system and has nothing else. And I think I was writing a short story collection in my MFA program about what it's like growing up mixed. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote the first line of Ball Don't Lie and it felt different. And I was like, huh, I don't think this is one of those stories. Maybe this is something different. And it became a novel. You mentioned a connection to your mother earlier when you were talking yes. about this book. You want to follow up on that? Yeah, so my mom, you know, she didn't grow up with a traditional family. She was sort of dropped off at her great grandmother's house when she was two years old and moved from house to house after that. Um, her grandmother, her great grandmother was a huge influence on her life, but I wanted to kind of explore that itinerant childhood, you know, in a way I was going back to explore what was my mom's life like when I was writing the character of Sticky, you know, mm -hmm. watching him navigate going from different home to different home. The book's dedicated to your parents. What's the greatest gift they've given you? Hard work. My, I, I view myself as a working class writer. I have, I have some, you know, writing colleagues who are just brilliant, brilliant people and they can sit down and write an amazing novel and I feel like I'm not that guy. I, I'm a working class writer. Instead of working with cement like my uncle, mm -hmm. I work with words, but I clock in every day and uh, that's my approach. And when I was young, I saw my mom and dad work so hard just to keep us, our heads above water. So I think it's showing up. To work every day. How involved were you with the movie production of Ball Don't Lie? I was lucky enough when when the book came out and uh, there were about three producers that wanted to to make it into a movie so I got to say will any of you let me co-write the script with whoever is going to be the writer and one of them did so uh, this director named Bryn Hill mm -hmm. came in and we co-wrote the script and in a weird way I think he taught me how to to write more visually because I think mm -hmm. I was trying to make the script beautiful, even the slug lines, you know, when mm -hmm. so-and-so walks into the room, I try to do it all poetic. Mm -hmm. And he's like, nobody's gonna read that except the actors. And so <laughs> it made me sit back and go, oh, wow, okay, so I understand now, you know, how to sort of 
do the utilitarian stuff in a script, but also keep the, the action super visual. How well do you think the movie serves the book? Well, I think uh, ideally a movie is its own thing. And so the, the, the movie version of Bald and Light is very, very uh, similar to the book. Mm -hmm. Um, in being a co-writer, I got to make sure that you know yes, nothing crazy yes. happened. Like no yeah. anacondas show up in the in the last scene. I think it serves the book really well, but the crazy thing is when you read the book, it's my heart, you know, and mm. and I got to control every moment. And the movie, you hand over control, so it still feels a little strange. Mm. Your second novel, Mexican White Boy, got rave reviews. People loved it. Mm -hmm. How in the world did it end up getting banned? <laughs> It got banned in a few places, and most most notably Arizona, which is very unfortunate. It got lumped into this program called the Mexican American Studies Program in the Tucson High School High School District, especially. And what happened is they viewed the program, the the the, the power that be that the politicians that were in, in office at the time, they said the Mexican American Studies Program is anti-white. It's we want to overthrow the government. So that, they thought that's, that was the agenda of the program. And so all the books that were on the teaching list, uh, part of the curriculum, they got, they got banned from the school. So Mexican American, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Mexican White Boy was one of the books that was pulled from the curriculum. But it's interesting you ask that because I got an email from one of the lawyers. They've been working mm -hmm. on this for mm -hmm. two years now. And she said the school has just voted to reinstate Mexican <laughs> white boys, so it can now be taught again as of, I think, last week. What did that do to you emotionally to have a book banned? Well, you know, when you're a young author, you always want to be banned, and you, you think, how cool <laughs> yeah, would it be if no. my book is banned and nobody could, you know, I'm so bad that you can't even read me. But then I actually went to Tucson High School where the book was banned, <clears throat> and I spoke to the students. And I saw who the book was banned from. Mm -hmm. It was banned from my target audience, mostly Mexican American kids who, you know, they re they really wanted to find themselves in literature, and hear this book with characters that look like them, written by somebody whose name is just like theirs. It was deemed illegal to read. It was actually boxed and put in the basement. So that was very sad. What kind of conversations did you have <clears throat> with those students? Well, it's funny because on the surface, they, they had their literature pulled from them. And I think the motivation politically was to sort of make sure that, hey, you know, respect the power that's, that's in office now. But what they succeeded in doing is creating a generation of activists. Mm -hmm. So these kids were chaining themselves to desks, saying, we want our program back, we want our books back. So in a way, they really motivated the students to fight even harder. I will say one of the most um, incredible experiences I've ever had as an author is going there, and I, I was lucky enough to take the honorarium that they gave me, and I got to use it to buy Mexican White Boy for every kid who had it taken out of their hands. So oh, that, that was pretty empowering. Oh, I, I imagine yeah. it was, and how nice of you to do that. It's got to be gratifying too, Matt, that so many of your books are chosen as quick picks for young readers. And I wondered if you give us your quick take on I Will Save You. I Will Save You is my sad, sad book. Uh, sometimes I'm with my editor and somebody will say, what's I Will Save You book? And I'll say, it's my saddest book. And my editor will say, we need to work on how you pitch this book. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, you know, there are more and more kids today suffering from depression. So I wanted to explore that. Did that have any kind of autobiographical substory for you? It, it really didn't. This was probably more in the education I chose. I, I majored in psychology and English, but I worked in a few schizophrenic homes, mm -hmm. and I worked with some at-risk kids, and I got to really follow their stories and read their files about wh what had happened to them. So it was more that book was born out of the people I had worked with when I was uh, in graduate school. When you go through difficult experiences like you're talking about, is writing cathartic? Oh yeah, I think art is the, is a great place to put your sadness. And uh, I go around to schools all over the country and one of my favorite things to do is encourage kids who maybe aren't viewed as the creative types, like the thuggy kids in the back of the class that don't really pay attention, 
they have some of the most amazing mm -hmm. pieces that they produce because they have they have so much going on inside and they can put it on the page and I, I really do think it's cathartic and also we want your quick take on we were here we were here um, is inspired by of mice and men mm -hmm. we were here we're not supposed to have favorite books but that is a very personal book to me. Uh, I worked at a group home mm -hmm. for two years after uh, undergrad, and uh, I set the book in, in a group home. And uh, one of the biggest things for me when I was working there is I saw these kids, some of them were really good kids, and they just messed up along the way. And I, I, I noticed that they were sort of shoved in the corner of society, and nobody really wanted to deal with them. So you put them in a home over here, but they want the world to know they exist too. So We Were Here is really about, it's an existential novel about we exist too. And uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a very, I don't know, it's, it's one of those books where when I wrote it, I, I don't even know how I did that book. But when I read it, I, I say to myself, that's what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. It's actually the reason that I kind of switched gears for the living is because I felt like I finally said what I wanted to say with a quiet literary story of kids up growing up on the wrong side of the tracks. Mm -hmm. Earlier you mentioned your audience. When you sit down to write your books, how do you envision your readers in your mind's eye? I actually don't, I don't think about audience at all. I think in a strange way I'm writing to myself. You mm -hmm. know? And, and now that I know that I'm writing young adult books and I'm actively doing that, I write to a younger version of myself. And what are the things that would excite me as a young reader, you know, what are the issues? Sure, there's the there's the plot, you know, the, the big story, um, the action of the story. But what is the undercurrent of the novel? What? How could I touch that former self that 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 I know wasn't so receptive to books? How can I get to that version of me? I guess I kind of think of uh, of it that way. You mentioned The Living, and it's a terrific mm -hmm. book. Why did you decide to blend genres? Was that fun for you? Oh, it was so fun. I think, uh, you know, I'd written these quieter books, and I said, I'm getting stagnant. You know, I'm doing mm -hmm. these similar stories. I want to jump outside of my comfort zone, because I feel like if you're too comfortable as a writer, I feel like that's when your prose dies. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm going to jump out of my comfort zone, and I'm going to have a huge wave, wreck a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean, and I'm gonna have my main characters try to survive this. So I think that's where it came from. It was like an exercise for me as a writer. But I also, I, I'm so fascinated by these incredible authors who can make a reader need to turn the page. Mm -hmm. You know, How do they do this? Mm -hmm. So I, I set out to try to write a book that had this immediacy, this, this uh, something that was propelling the reader forward. And I feel like I, I'm getting some response where people are like, I couldn't put it down, which I had never really had before. You know, I, I'd had these quieter literary books mm -hmm. that were more of a deeper exploration. And now it's kind of fun to have a more of a page turning book. How would you pitch this book to reluctant readers? Well, I would always come in with the, the contextual world, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the giant wave that wrecks the ship and now they're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean trying to survive will they be able to underneath all that though i would never mention this to them but it's really an exploration of class mm -hmm. you know you have the wealthiest of the wealthy on a cruise ship with these kids who have nothing growing up by the border and they're working at the, on the cruise ship but when the ship goes down it doesn't matter how much money you have we're all on the same level introduce us to your lead mm -hmm. character my, my main character's name is Shy. I love the name. <laughs> I love it. Well, I love Shy because Shy has, he originated in a failed novel that I wrote 10 years ago. <laughs> and I loved everything about the book. It was my favorite book I've ever written, but it wasn't good enough. There, there was no real plot. But I really liked this kid Shy, so I pulled him out of that book, put him in another book that didn't work. Then I pulled him out of that one and put him in the living. So I've been trying to write Shy for 10 years. and. I feel like I finally pulled it off. So he, he grew up or is growing up right on the border of Mexico and San Diego. He has nothing. He might have aspirations of college. He's pretty good at basketball. And he gets a summer job working on a cruise ship that takes him totally outside of his neighborhood. Did you always know you were going to write a sequel? Yes, I did. I started 
the book thinking, the very beginning of the book, and this is a minor, minor spoiler alert, but the very beginning of the book, Shy witnesses somebody jump over the edge. Mm -hmm. I knew that that was the key to not only this book, but the next book, the, one, the guy who jumped over. And the well, next book, The Hunted, begins on 44 days. Yes, exactly, uh, into the tragedy. exactly. So it really does sort of pick up where the living left off, except for I sort of skip them getting back to California. And it begins on the coast of California with them making it home, but now they discover what's happened to California with this massive earthquake. We want to avoid those spoilers you yeah. mentioned a moment ago, but uh, this book will be out in a few months, and I wanted to, to ask you if there was any way you could tell us, without giving things away, what it is that you still wanted to know about Shy. What did you still have to learn about Shy? I think it's Really, it's what sh what I wanted Shy to learn about himself. Oh, that's good. Yeah, because yes. there's a character in there named Shoe Shine. In a str he's an adult. And Where do you come up with these great <laughs> names? Well, you know, one of the things that I think I wish young adult authors would think about more is the adult characters in the story. Mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes they get shortchanged in young adult literature, and so I'm really, really um, I concentrate on trying to really build out. The, the adult characters. And so Shoe Shine is an, an older man, he, shoes, he shines shoes on the ship, but he's really the heartbeat of the entire book. And over the course of The Hunted, he's actually teaching Shy mm -hmm. what, it, what it means to think the way Shoe Shine thinks. Seems to me that The Living and, and The Hunted, and that these are really perfect for movie movies. Anything in the works? There has been some definite talk about movies. Oh, Nothing that I can really, great. really say you know is concrete yet, but it does seem like there's a good chance of this happening. And that mm -hmm. would be so exciting for me. And also, I can't tell you how many young readers mm -hmm. will, will email me and say, when's this going to be a movie? And it'd be so great to say to them, well, here's a date. <laughs> what other kinds of feedback do you get from your readers? I think there are two types of feedback I get. So I get some feedback from readers that I've never met. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, in Wyoming or, <laughs> you know, Wisconsin. And they say they've read the books and they talk about, a lot of people say, the people who are in your books are like my friends and my family. And mm, that's most, nice. Yeah, and most of these are working class kids. And thank, thank God they, they see themselves in the books. But then there's another type of feedback. It's where I go to a school, because I do a lot of school mm -hmm. visits, and I'll meet a bunch of kids who have never read my books and then six months later I'll hear from a few of them and they'll say after you came I read every one of your books and here's my favorite and why or this one I didn't like and I just love hearing from readers a lot of people don't realize this but um, young adult uh, authors have a great setup simply because young readers are the most loyal readers in the world If they like one of your books they're gonna read every single thing you've ever done Mm -hmm. You also write picture books. Why did you decide to focus on Joe Lewis? Joe Lewis, uh, he, he demonstrated so much grace in, a, in a, such an aggressive um, profession, boxing. But the, the fact that he was the kind of guy who would be more likely to help you up after he knocked you down than to talk trash. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to work with him. I, I'm very interested also in how sports can transcend sport. Mm -hmm. So the way that Joe Lewis, um, for the first time ever, not only was black America rooting for Joe Lewis against Max Schmeling, you know, part of Hitler's mm -hmm. Germany, but white America was rooting for him too. And it was so great to read about, you know, when both races in a time of racial tension were coming together to really rally behind an African-American athlete. And just recently, you released The Last Stop on Market Street. It's gotten starred review in Kirkus, a starred review in Publishers Weekly. You've got to be feeling pretty good. I'm excited. Uh, the illustrator, I was lucky enough to work with Kadir Nelson on the first book, uh, A Nation's Hope. And then I was matched with this incredible young illustrator named Christian Robinson. He is going to take over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's going to win a Caldecott for sure at some point. Um, and we work together a little bit, and, and the story is so fun because it's fiction. It's about a little boy and his grandmother leaving church, taking the bus to their destination. And 
You know, I think in this today's world, young people are so inundated with this idea of you should have this, you should mm -hmm. have this, mm -hmm. and it feeds them into wanting and wanting and wanting. And I, I was thinking when I was writing this book, what's the counter narrative? So the grandmother in the story, Nana, she's the counter argument and she's basically telling him through the entire bus ride, but you have, you have, you have. So it's sort of, that's the message of it, mm -hmm. but it's also just fun. And uh, mm -hmm. the illustrator, I think, is just an incredible visual storyteller. When you think back over your body of work, I mentioned for a young guy, you've got all these books. <laughs> what do you see as your primary message? The, the thing that I set out to do is show moments of grace and dignity on the wrong side of the tracks, the quote unquote wrong side of the tracks. Because I think sometimes the people living in the neighborhoods that aren't the ideal neighborhoods, sometimes they're forgotten about in literature. And I think there are some amazing, beautiful things happening in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell the sto those stories. You know, I grew up in a working class family right by the border. And I think sometimes when I would read books, I couldn't identify with the people. And I hope that the people like me reading books today, young people, will find themselves in, in, in the stuff I write. Do you ever plan to write any adult books? Oh my gosh, so that's my dream. <laughs> I have one halfway done, and I, I would love to be able to do that because I have adult things that I would like to explore too, especially now that I have a little daughter. <laughs> I want to write picture books and adult books because I have you know a family now. Matt, it's been so great having you with us. Thank you so much. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.